this is update for August 5, 2022, day 163 of the war, end of the date update. <laughs> so I would like to a little bit catch up uh, on the uh, changes that were happening in Ukrainian uh, uh, political circles over past 10 days and not so much about the changes themselves, but hopefully it helps you to understand the common thread or trend that's been going on in terms of new people that have been appointed. So if you remember, um, I made a video on July 9 about Yermak and his connection to Russia, Russian uh, K, uh, well, KGB and uh, on Russian spy agencies and his father and so on. And there were a bunch of more people that are connected. So, uh, and then uh, then there was accusations uh, from uh, um, U.S. Uh, repre uh, representative Victoria Sparks that led to uh, dismissal of some of their uh, officials in Ukrainian government. And if you remember, there was um, attorney general fired. Uh, and let's just focus on that. So that attorney general was that was she. Uh, she was fired, uh, and we mentioned at that time that um, that attorney general she was pretty competent and she was a pretty shrewd bureaucrat, and she wanted to fight and she didn't want to leave. However, on the next day, she basically folded and kind of like so left without creating too much noise, too much any too any, without any disruption. So now uh, it's becoming clear why. So she basically was offered position as Ukrainian ambassador, amb ambassador in, uh, uh, in Switzerland, which is a nice, uh, you know, as you can imagine, nice position, long-term post, government uh, position, well pay, you know, kind of like pretty much do nothing basically uh, and uh, you know, stay in, in, in a nice place. So the new person who was appointed is uh, this Andrei Kostin. Uh, this is a new attorney general. And as we expected that time, this was done in order to consolidate power by Yermak. And, and the more we think about this, Yermak is just a, a lightning rod for Ukrainian president. It's really, Ukrainian president is pretty, how to say, uh, power hungry individual that uh, really he runs the show and uh, Irmak is just, uh, as we said, lightning wrong. So what happens is that uh, this Andrei Kostin is actually best friend of Irmak. Basically, that's his protege. And now, <clears throat> now they have totally uh, sort of puppet uh, attorney general that will do whatever is needed without uh, uh, asking a single question just kind of like exec mindless executioner in this position. And again, he was from the same, uh, from the president's party, um, uh, so people's servant, that's probably the, pro the correct name of the party. So that's, uh, that's sort of one sort of appointee. So we, we covered one. So now you basically understand this consolidation of power, again, connection to all Sort of Russian uh, uh, special services, sort of the same. That's one kind of one point here. Then uh, there was, uh, then yeah, Ukrainian president appointed uh, her, her son governor, even if it's like occupied, you know, as he appointed him, his name Yaroslav Yanushevich. And he actually has even more deeper connection to. Uh, Yanukovych government and specifically Yanukovych had his kind of like economic czar, czar. Uh, his name was Azaro. He actually came into power uh, in about 98, 97. Um, he uh, basically, did, we have strong suspicion that he was a uh, KGB asset and his goal was to Sort of control financial and economic life in Ukraine and make the, um, I'll say, regulations and laws as unbearable as possible in order to create as much corruption and as possible. So Azarov has been in charge of U uh, Ukrainian tax administration, 
So it's kind of like a, I guess equivalent for like for example in US it would be IRS. And so he was all always sort of uh, focused on I'd say uh, creating uh, as difficult uh, conditions for for private businesses, raising taxes, basically all of their um, you know creating more regulations, basically creating as many problems as possible so the business doesn't sort of doesn't flourish and the the entrepreneurs try to kind of leave the country. So that person uh, was running essentially economic life of the country since about that time, 97, 98, till uh, the time that uh, Yanukovych was ousted and, and fled Ukraine and he took Azaro with him to, you know, to Russia. And now Azaro is sometimes speaking on Russian propaganda channels, talking, you know, all, all of the negativities about Ukraine, basically. Uh, so this person, Yaroslav Yanushevich, was sort of, how to say, trusted person of Azarov and best friend of Azarov's son, which obviously also fled the country with Azarov. So you can imagine in 2014, when, the, when Yanukovych fled and new government came, this uh, Yanushevich was actually um, like uh, there was a law passed that prevented people like him who served the previous uh, government to to be in power essentially to participate in a, in 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 a new government. Nevertheless, once the um, Delensky was elected in 2019, then Yanushevich went went to the court in 2020 or 2021 and basically uh, revoked that. Uh, that regulation and basically that allow him to reinstate himself again into power. So now he's appointed uh, as a governor of uh, Kherson. Uh, and in Ukraine, it's not elected position; it's uh, it's being appointed uh, by uh, by the president. Uh, then let's actually look at the third person. Uh, this is Olga Savgirya. She's newly appointed uh, judge of the Constitutional Court, so let's say U.S. equivalent probably would be Supreme Court. Uh, again, the same connections. Um, so she uh, she worked with Andre Portnoy. Again, you may want to watch that video from uh, July nine, and then we we had a couple more in in like you know subsequent uh, videos and several fo like next following days that were sort of looking at uh, uh, Portno, then Demchenko, all of those people. And uh, so she was uh, working uh, with Portno uh, as um, uh, legal research in the, in, in the university. And the uh, legal, uh, uh, that department was run by Portno. So basically she was protege of, of Portno. And at that time, she she wrote research paper for uh, constitutional court of Ukraine that was essentially kind of like green lighting uh, signing of the agreement with Russia by Yanukovych that allowed Russia to have a Crimean base till 2047, which right now, as everyone understands, it was uh, as was mistake and not even mistake it was sort of uh, basically, you know, done by the hands of Yanukovych and, and his people uh, at the Russia's request. Basically, he was totally Russian puppet. And so this was all arranged and, and set up, basically. And so she was sort of instrumental in all of this. Uh, she wrote research paper uh, saying that uh, constitutional court should stay away from this issue and so on. And in this case, you don't need to say anything against it. All you need just to say, okay, I'm going to be neutral. I'm going to stay away. And that's enough for, uh, for the things to go in the way that uh, <laughs> Russian special services wanted. And that's what happened. And so as you can see, this is again, kind of building the sort of case about this whole Yermak Russian connection and, uh, you know, Russian infiltration in the Ukrainian talk. So as you can see, all of the three new, all three new appointees, key figures, they have, you know, influence uh, on many things. They all tied to, uh, let's say, KGB and so on. 
so this is just a kind of quick update and sort of understanding of the trends. Even, you know, there is a war. Uh, Ukraine is really uh, on, the, on the edge of uh, total disaster, uh, military and econ economy-wise. And nevertheless, uh, people who were appointed are uh, suspected uh, Russian assets uh, in Ukraine. So this is um, kind of like uh, what's going on, on sort of in, on this front. Then uh, let's actually look at economic situation in Ukraine and not so much economic and financial. So if you remember, uh, uh, I discussed situation when Ukrainian central bank uh, was basically prohibiting this uh, foreign currency exchange points to show the exchange rates in order to kind of like not to to suppress the devaluation of Ukrainian revenue versus US dollar, which is, was at that time in free fall. Now it's stabilized uh, for its own reasons. It has nothing to do with central bank. Basically, the, 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 sort of the move has exhausted itself uh, naturally and sort of financially, and it's stabilized around uh, 41 revenue uh, 41 for $1. Dollar. So what uh, now central bank is doing, they actually closed up um, uh, 600 this uh, foreign exchange uh, 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 foreign exchange points where basically you buy and sell currency. And that's about 15% of the market. So as you can see, this is again uh, action that really undermines you know, economic freedom, uh, financial freedom, and opportunity to sort of uh, kind of create your own business or whatever, do your own sort of basically to, to act as independent uh, economic actor for everyone, right? So this is another uh, situation where is monopolization and uh, overreach of the power. And you can even say that this is attempt to create sort of financial tyranny, right? Uh, so this again kind of highlights then add all of these people that connected to Russia. Uh, so you can see the policies that's being you have you will have a good impression of the policies that being done by Ukrainian talk. There is another uh, curious uh, news that Ukrainian president revoked uh, diplomatic passports from 225 uh, members of Ukrainian parliament parliament. Uh, Ukrainian parliament has uh, 450 members, uh, but because some territories are occupied, so the real number was about 410. So as you can see, this is essentially a majority of Ukrainian parliament and including his own party. Uh, most actually people are in his own party. And this is again, the reason it's been done. So this members of the parliament would not go uh, outside of the country and then they don't sort of share their own sort of independent views that sort of don't align uh, with Ukrainian president's sort of, I'll say, agenda and what he's doing. So again, this is, you can see there's again monopolization and desire to sort of have a full control of everything. Uh, in, in many ways, not much different from Russia. Um, so this is, uh, however, this having said all of this, it doesn't mean that, you know, Ukrainian government is one thing, but as mentioned many times, Ukrainian people is totally different thing. And there is uh, definitely desire and, and, and a lot of sacrifice being done by Ukrainian people for, their, for, for themselves. They're not fighting for Ukrainian president, they're not fighting for Ukrainian government. They're fighting for, there is full realization that they're fighting for their own right for, to self-determination. That that's very simple, and their own desire not to be part of the other oppressive system. Essentially, that's if you boil that down, that's what it is. Uh, there is also uh, there was also appointment of anti-corruption uh, attorney, uh, which is much ado about nothing. Uh, this this been going on in Ukraine since about 2015. All of this anti-corruption uh, service, uh, you know. So, um, agencies or anti-corruption attorneys they essentially do nothing suck a lot of resources and in a way it's kind of like uh, sort of uh, another layer on the corruption to the corruption system 
So they don't resolve anything, and that's very misguided policy actually from the West that pushes for all of this, uh, and it really doesn't resolve any problems because corruption is a symptom. It's not the root cause. And by simply having this anti-corruption attorneys who fight sort of corruption, you're not addressing the root cause, you're addressing the symptom. That's why there is this you know, analogy with uh, swamp and, and, the, and the mosquitoes on the swamp. So basically you're catching mosquitoes, but the swamp produces mosquito, mosquitoes all the time. So you will never sort of solve the problem, right? And by sort of catching one mosquito, two mosquitoes there, because there will be sort of like 10, 10 more mosquitoes born, right? So this is, uh, again, very misguided policy, it doesn't lead to anything and, and doesn't really help Ukraine, actually. Uh, so nevertheless, this being done, they probably will be, again, as, in, as ineffective as, uh, as uh, their pre predecessors. And essentially nothing is going to be done, but a huge amount of financial resources will be wasted on their support. Now let's actually move to the military situation. Let's actually uh, look at high level what's going on. So Ukrainian army was, uh, has attacked uh, Russian ammunition depot in uh, Bereslav here near Kachovka. Uh, it looks like it was a successful attack. Then it attacked this bridge in uh, Darivka over this Inholetsk river. Again, we don't have any sort of visual visuals from that attack, but we're pretty sure that you know there's additional damage to the bridge and it's probably also barely usable at this point. So just as a summarize the situation, the situation is the following. The main Antonivsky bridge is probably barely usable at this point. This bridge over in Holetz near village Dari, uh, Darivka uh, is also barely usable at this point. Uh, the railroad bridge that's next to Antonievsky bridge uh, is might be usable. It was damaged, but it's possible that the damage has been repaired or at least like sort of superficially just to kind of survive for another month or so. So that is still somewhat unclear. And then there is this um, dam uh, that goes over Dnipro River in uh, Nova Kachovka. There, there was damage over the bridge. Uh, damage was repaired. There was no new attacks to our knowledge. So that is uh, somewhat usable. So in other words, the summary is the following. The <clears throat> supply has been complicated for the Russian side. Nevertheless, it was not severed enough to sort of truly create significant problems um, to continue defending uh, Kherson bridgehead. Uh, this is, uh, nevertheless, this is a sort of very, uh, you know, excellent opportunity for Ukrainian side, because this is something that the Ukrainian, call it army, can chew, can execute, giving its general very, um, like, low level in terms of its ability to execute things. Properly and most again from the you know stemming from the command from the we discussed this question of the Soviet army that this is just a small Soviet army versus Russia is being big Soviet army that's really the the clash of the two Soviet armies and the Soviet army is I mean the most the most important characteristic of it is uh, insane bureaucracy and disempowerment of everyone where you really just a cog in the system and the system is actually managed uh, quite terribly. So it leads to extreme waste of resources and by resources we mean human lives and also, you know, just physical resources, which is, you know, less important. But in Ukraine case, it actually is extremely important because Ukraine does not have any near uh, level of Russian um, resources. And uh, in order to be able to successfully defend itself, it needs to be much, much, much of more efficient than the Russian army uh, in order to inflict the losses that Russia cannot sustain and have to sort of, uh, you know, retreat or, or sign a peace agreement or whatever it is. Nevertheless, uh, this is something that can be done by a uh, Ukrainian army. It has the tools. And by cutting off effectively Russian 
supply to the Kherson bridgehead, uh, it creates opportunity to liberate this, uh, this, um, this territories on the western bank of uh, Dnipro River. Um, so we'll see if this is going to be done or this all Ukrainian command will lack focus and determination to actually sort of kind of execute on it. Basically, it's trying to do something, but it doesn't look like it's determined and focused uh, approach to executing uh, on, on this whole idea. Now let's actually do walk through the front line. We, uh, we're going to do it in clockwise fashion as always going to start from the very north. So there's, as always, exchange of all sorts of fire along the <clears throat> state border here uh, in uh, Sumen and Chernihiv region on the Ukrainian side. And that's going to be uh, Bransk, uh, Kursk and Belgorod region on the Russian side. Now let's jump to Kharkiv, uh, area um, east of Kharkiv. Things here uh, uh, on, on pause. Nothing major is happening here, it's so call it quiet. Now let's jump to Izum Bridgehead and we're going to touch base on that uh, Balaklia area, which we kind of consider one big, one big um, sort of section of front line. So let's just first look at uh, Izum Bridgehead. There were some relatively weak Russian attacks in typical areas towards Bohrodichne and towards towards the villages Dolina Krasnopilia. This is this the, basically this is main road that leads to Slavyansk. Uh, they did they were not successful. So uh, and again we were more think of them as sort of destruction for Ukrainian command to kind of paint the picture that Russian troops <coughs> sorry are still there. Then Russian Russian command is continuing this attack towards uh, Usarivka. So far, they were not successful. Mm, it's still unclear to us if this is again some kind of distraction or major move. We kind of leaning it's more of a distraction. Could be we could be totally wrong. This is just based on the idea that Russian troops or Russian command does not have spare uh, resources to create like third axis of attack because as we discussed there are two main ones is north Donbass and an area straight west of Donetsk so those are two main areas where Russian command is concentrating its resources where it's really hammering very strongly uh, and where everything goes all of the support resources everything human uh, resources and, and reserve everything goes there so we doubt that at this moment Russian troops Russian command would create sort of open up like third axis of attack because that that so basically dilutes the resources that they dedicated for those, those two areas and makes uh, the whole kind of plan less likely to be successful but nevertheless let's it's important to watch what's going to happen here because if russian command is successful here this this really could be devastating to ukrainian defensive position uh, now let's actually move and see what's going on uh, in the north Donbass here. So as we discussed, the northern section of it is kind of like dead and quiet. Russian troops are focusing on this uh, like sort of southern section of the north Donbass front line and specifically on this area on the, on the town of Bakhmut and Solidar. So this is where the main of the major attacks are happening. So far today, they were not successful. That doesn't mean that things are stable. Uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian command is not controlling situation and has not been able to create sort of strategic answer to Russian attacks. So it just uh, right now, it's probably more of the Russian troops are regrouping after like initial gains of uh, yesterday and day before yesterday and prepare more preparing for the major assault on Bakhmut because as we discussed they got into uh, eastern outskirts of um, suburbs I guess probably better say suburbs of Bakhmut so they control already like eastern sort of suburbs here so they just probably preparing for like large attack on the Bakhmut uh, so this is probably why we kind of like have like a just a small break basically to for Russian troops to prepare for the major assault here. Uh, now let's move um, sort of 
Mosau, so this is what we discussed, this Bakhmut, Solidar, two key objectives in this area. And then the Russian troops are attacking along the, the whole front line here, this like the most southern section, just kind of trying to push and squeeze Ukrainian troops uh, from here. And this is probably more of the sort of supportive area in terms of uh, ensuring that Ukrainian command cannot sort of pull like kind of like idle units from this area and throw to, to Bakhmut area essentially. So this is more of purpose of this attack is, is that. So the, again, they were, the Russian troops were not successful uh, today in any of these points. Again, it doesn't mean that situation is under control by Ukrainian command. It's just sort of kind of like temporary sort of just just another day it doesn't sort of say much about the future uh, of the ukraine's uh ukrainian's uh, ability to sort of continue defenses here successfully specifically now let's move actually uh, to the area west of donetsk let's see what's going on there again the situation is similar to what's going on north uh, on the northern uh, northern bus front line uh, after initial gains, Russian troops are stalled in Piski. They still did not manage to fully uh, gain control of this village. They essentially had control the majority of it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they were not able to fully squeeze Ukrainian troops out. As we discussed, the Ukrainian command uh, put uh, through more reserves here, more reinforcements. But as we mentioned before, the way it works is this is just a, let's say, a temporary solution. Uh, once those reserves will be chewed up by Russian artillery, it again open up, opens up sort of doors or gates for the advance of the Russian infantry. So again, as we mentioned many, many times before, Ukrainian uh, command does not have or not capable of creating strategic answer to all to this Russian strategy of, uh, you know, uh, creating a moon landscape, uh, ramming through with artillery, and then uh, infantry comes up and mops up the remaining resistance. So there is no really answer on the Ukrainian side, even though the tools are there. So it's more of the organizational and competency problem uh, on Ukrainian command rather than anything else. So um, the same situation here in Marinka, where Russian troops actually didn't even uh, get much traction in the first place. So they stalled here completely. So right now, the, the sort of the area of the most advanced Russian side is this village Piski. So let's actually quickly look again, just recap it. Again, this is Piski. This is uh, uh, Donetsk International Airport which saw intense fighting in uh, January of uh, 2015, it was essentially destroyed in that fighting. Uh, so this is, uh, this is Pesky Russian, uh, Russian troops are still trying to squeeze Ukrainian side, uh, but for now they sort of not successful. And this is uh, another major Ukrainian stronghold here, uh, which is uh, coal mine, and so it was uh, captured in the first days of this offensive, but so far Russian troops could not move further than this. So again, uh, we don't think that this is sort of uh, sort of final situation. The Russian troops will continue uh, attacks. Uh, it's only a question of uh, getting reinforcements and essentially getting soldiers uh, from Russia, which, as we all know. There is, they, they feel the most acute shortage uh, of the soldiers, so basically of in their ability to fill the front line. So that's the biggest problem on the Russian side right now. Uh, now let's actually move and look what's going on in the Parisia front line. Things here are quiet. Uh, everything is on pause. Nothing really new here to report. Now let's jump to Kherson bridgehead. Uh, sort of just to kind of like quickly recap, uh, Russian troops here are still trying to des to destroy Ukrainian bridgehead. This near the Vidiv bridge, basically kind of like it goes well, I guess southwest from the Vidiv bridge. So basically, the Vidiv bridge is the 
point where <clears throat> that is controlled by Russian troops, and then like then south uh, west of it, and this whole area is controlled by Ukrainian side. There are a couple villages there, and so far Russian troops were unsuccessful uh, in throwing them from this bridgehead. Then this is the, this Darivka uh, bridge over uh, in Holets River that uh, saw attack, uh, and apparently it's also severely damaged, uh, barely usable. So again, just. This is Antonievsky Bridge, barely usable, probably at this point, kind of not usable. Then this uh, uh, bridge over Darivka is also barely usable. So Russian troops are using pontoon and ferries to help them. But as we discussed, the throughput is definitely not there. It's not uh, going to be enough, especially for artillery, right? Because Russian troops use a lot of ammunition, right? And it's very bulky, and so you really need large throughput to supply enough ammunition uh, to the uh, ar artillery units. So that, that is going to be difficult. Not to mention that now this whole <clears throat> bridgehead is effectively split into two halves with the destruction of this uh, Darivka bridge, right? They will still use obviously pontoons, but it's, as we discussed, not the same as normal bridges. So the only still somewhat usable and viable um, way of um, logistical way is this dam. It was somewhat damaged, but as we discussed, it, it has been repaired. Uh, even though a repair is not quality, it's not going to last. But you know, Russian command is not thinking about like you know what's going to happen in six months and so on or in a year. If it's going to collapse, it's going to collapse. Uh, so they're just trying. They're just thinking very short term. Uh, how we're gonna survive, let's say, next uh, two weeks or three weeks or next month. So that's essentially the approach there. So uh, this is the only sort of viable line that Russia still has under its control. So we would not be surprised if there are new attacks towards uh, this uh, dam and specifically that bridge because the dam is uh, is not being attacked really. The what Ukrainian command is targeting is the bridge that's next to the dam that sort of provides ability for the ships to go up and down the river so it's essentially kind of tiny channel uh, next to the dam so that's what uh, Ukrainian command is trying to destroy uh, that's it for today thanks for watching and until tomorrow bye bye